Hello everyone, welcome to the GOE Ecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and you have been watching my videos on various aspects of geography. So in this session, we are going to introduce the oceanography and we are going to start a series on oceanography. So in the first lecture today, we are going to look at the nature and scope of oceanography and various facets of oceans. So let's begin. But before we go ahead, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and also share the videos with others as well. So now let's learn about the oceanography. So what is this oceanography all about? It is about the earth system in which ocean is one of the most important part or one of the most important component. So why is it that it is one of the most important component? Because it mediates the process in the atmosphere by this transfer of mass, momentum and energy. Remember these three things, mass, momentum and energy through the sea surface. So that's why ocean is one of the most important aspects of the planet. So it receives water and dissolved substances from the land. And also remember, if you remember the geosynclinal theory, all that theory or plate tectonics theory, remember it is based on the same concept that evolution of these landforms on the earth has lots to do with these oceans, right? So remember the substances that are dissolved like the particles that is like sediments and everything else apart from the water that it receives from the river. So all these things are dissolved in the ocean. Then it also lays down sediments that eventually becomes rock on land. Remember the geosynclinal theory as we have referred and hence an understanding of the ocean is important in terms of what? In terms of understanding as an earth system or earth system science, right? So especially for understanding important problems such as global climate change or global warming. So these are the phenomena where ocean is one of the most important attribute or one of the most important factor, right? So it is like a pivot. So everything else related to climate and the entire biosphere revolves around this oceanography. That's why it is one of the most important aspect. And remember the physical component of ocean that is physical oceanography along with this meteorology are the two important factors of the entire physical geography that are one of the most emerging or one of the most important aspects in current scenario or in today's world, right? Because most of the phenomena is related to ocean in some way directly or indirectly. So today let's understand this entire basic structure of oceanography and also about a little in terms of the ocean structure that is part of the physical oceanography. So the first question that we need to answer here is why do we study the oceans? So the answer to this question depends upon our interests. So what is that thing that is interesting related to human beings which is associated to ocean? So if you look into the broad themes, you'll find that first important thing where we are concerned, this is where we get our food from the ocean, right? So remember, ocean is one of the most important supplier of our food that is important. Then we use the ocean for different purposes. For example, one is transport, the other such as recreational facilities, swimming, boating, fishing, surfing, diving. So these are the things that are associated where we use oceans for different purposes. Then ocean influences the atmospheric or the what we say is weather and climate phenomena. So the entire climatology, we have studied that oceans are one of the most important building blocks or one of the most important attributes of the world climate, right? So that is why it is important. And of late, due to global climate change, extreme events have been happening. Lots of storms, hurricanes, typhoons, cyclones, all these things have been happening of late. And that's why oceanography becomes one of the most sought after subjects in terms of physical geography and also holds key to the geography optional paper in civil services examination as well. So if you look into the branches of oceanography, we have physics branch, the biology branch, the geology branch and the chemistry branch of oceanography. So four branches. Remember chemistry, we study ocean chemistry, the limnology. In physics, we study the fluid dynamics, the marine physics, the bathymetry, the hydrology. Then in biology, it is all about the aquatic ecology, marine biology, right? So in geology, what we do is this paleo-oceanography and marine geology. So all these together build up the oceanography as a complete subject part of the physical geography that we study. So now let's elaborate further more. Now if we look into the historical setting or the historical aspect of this learning about oceans, it leads us back to about 4000 before common era if you say BCE. So 
When you see Mesopotamians and the Phoenicians, their navigators traded over long distances across the Mediterranean, across the seas, up till Pacific. Then what we see during Greco-Roman era, many scholars wrote about the different aspects of ocean. Pythias was one of the scholars who explored the Atlantic from Italy to Norway in about 325 before Common Era. Then Arabic traders used the entire Indian Ocean, what you see in during that time, where lots of land routes were blocked. So what happened? Ocean routes, especially in the Arabian Sea, were open. And remember the discovery of monsoon and other phenomena related to that. So that was happening during the Middle Ages. Also, the routes to China was discovered. Then the connection between the tides and the sun and the moon. Now remember this is one of the most important thing that was described in Samaveda of the early Indian Vedic period that starts from 2000 to about 1400 before common era. So remember this relationship between tides and the phases of sun and moon. This was a relationship that was later on in the modern oceanography as a subject when it was established. Then we study that as a part of our syllabus also, right? So what is this connection was already described in somewhere in Indian literature. Then modern European knowledge began during the age of discovery. Remember, if you have not watched the videos on age of discovery, it's already there on my channel in the playlist in evolution of geographical thought as age of discovery. There we have also discussed about that what happened during age of discovery. So these are the sailors who actually took the world by surprise. They actually discovered all the oceans. So the names are Bartholomew Diaz. Then we have Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, Ferdinand Magellan. All these scholars and all these navigators, if you say so, they were responsible for the discovery of this entire ocean surface and many trade routes, global trade routes came out after this 16th century exploration. Then what you see is geography became a subject in university system in about 19th century and in 20th century the growing science and technology, the satellite technology, drifters, autonomous instruments, all these things made it more vast and more lucrative subject in terms of also economics, also in terms of the global trade and many any other related geopolitical event as well. So what you find is that now we use satellites to study ocean, its air, land and all this interaction, right? So this is the history which has been there and just in a brief we discussed what we have traveled in last 5000 years roughly. So now we are studying oceans in detail with different advanced systems, right? So now let's elaborate further more. So now talking about ocean relief feature which is part of the physiography or physical oceanography that we see, right? Let's understand how how is the physical structure of the ocean? So the oceans are the largest and most prominent feature on the earth that we already know. It is about 70% of earth's surface and it is also formed due to what? The same processes that we have already discussed in the geomorphology that is tectonic, volcanic, erosional and depositional processes. So these are the physical processes which have shaped up the structure of our ocean. Now let's understand what are the major and minor relief features associated with the ocean. So one by one, we are going to discuss all the major and minor features. So first of all, the ocean's major relief features have been divided into these four aspects. What are these four aspects? First one is called continental shelf. The second is called continental slope. The third is continental rise. And the fourth one is the deep sea plain or what we also know by the name of abyssal plain. So we have shelf, slope, rise and plain. So we have SSRA, right? So this is shelf, slope, rise and the abyssal plane. So what is this shelf, what is this slope and what is rise and what is this plane? If you want to look at this particular structure, this is the shelf structure. It's just like a bookshelf, right? So this is where the entire activity alongside the land is there. So you have beaches out here and then you have all the major activities on this shelf area. Then what you have is this slope area, which is this steep gradient, what you see here. And then again, what you see is the establishing part, which is again, it is rising, right? So after this steep slope, you have this next third layer, which is kind of a rise. And then again, you have further this plane. So what you have is this four steps that you see. One is the shelf, then is the slope, then is a little rise what you have again and then further you have a plane. So these are the four steps that you see and this is how the major ocean relief features are there, right? But apart from these major ocean relief features, what you see is there are numerous minor relief features as well. So let's understand about these major and minor features in details now. 
So the minor ocean relief features, if you see, what are the list? Ridges, hills, sea mounts, giots, trenches, canyons, sleeps. Then you have fracture zones, Iceland arcs, atolls, coral reefs, submerged volcanoes, sea scarps. Now remember, most of these land features we have studied in the landforms that is in part of geomorphology as surface features. So similar features also exist all across the oceans as well. So remember, if you remove the water, this also looks like what you have on land. On land, we have all these features like ridges and valleys. Right? We have these hills as well. We have these scarps as well. Right? And various kinds of island arcs. That is what we have is volcanic arcs on land. Right? We have canyons. We have gorges. We have deeps. Right? Deeper valleys. Similarly, in ocean floor also, we have these minor features which are very specific to these oceans and they are also named specifically. So, let's elaborate further more. So, now if you look into the first major feature, it is called continental shelf. Right? And continental shelf is basically the gently sloping seaward extension of our continental plate only. Right? It is gently sloping. So what is the degree of slope? It is about average 1 degree or even lesser. Right? And remember it covers about 7.5% of the total area of oceans. So that is the major chunk of the ocean. That is 7.5% of the total ocean is shelf area. And remember from this shelf area, when it breaks down to the slope, this particular area, this junction, this is called shelf break. That is a terminology that we should remember. And also, continental shelves are covered with what? Variable thickness all across the globe. Why? Because of the sediment factor that are brought by these rivers. Remember, these rivers are actually depositing all the sediments at this shelf area only, where you have delta formation, which we have discussed in the previous lectures also. Right? So this is a depositional place where you have this shelf area and the river brings material and deposits there. Right? So these places have lots of depositions and remember where is there is deposition. So what do you have there? Sedimentary rocks and within those sedimentary rocks what we have is the fossil fuels, petroleum, oil, all these things happening. So examples of this continental shelf of Southeast Asia, Great Banks, Newfoundland area that we have there. Then we have submerged region between Australia and New Guinea. So what you have here is that entire world has this continental shelf. Some places they are longer shelf, some places they are shorter shelf, right? So this is what we have as the first major feature. Then if we look at this area, which is the shelf in the terms of formation or the process, these are the three points that we need to remember. The first point is the submergence of part of continent. So if it is submerged, then it becomes a shelf area. Then if there is a relative rise in sea level, then also there can be a part of the submerged coast, remember? Then sedimentary deposits brought down by rivers can give this extension. This shelf area can be extended by sedimentary deposits. So that is important. And for example, if you want to look into the world map, you can note it down. You can pause the video here. There are various types of shelves based on different sediments of terrestrial origin. For example, glaciated shelves. Where are they found? surrounding Greenland area, then coral reef shelf, they are found near Australia, Queensland, then shelf of a large river around Nile Delta, you can find the shelf of a river originated, that is river brought sediments. Then shelf with dendritic valleys, remember these valleys which are of dendritic shape, these kind of river valleys which are there on land are also there extending towards the ocean. So that is near the mouth of Hudson River if you see. Then shelf along young mountain ranges. What you find where? It is in Hawaiian Islands. So these are some of the examples of different kinds of shells formed by different processes all around the world if you want to locate. So you can practice these places on the world map and that would help you in making a good answer for your examination. Then what we have is the width and depth factor. So looking at the width, it extends from 70 to 80 kilometer as an average value. So it may extend as far as about 1500 kilometers also in some of the Siberian areas, right? And it can also be as minimum as 120 kilometer as well at different coastal areas. So this is varying and that's why the average value comes to be about 70 to 80 kilometers all around the world. Now in terms of depth, if we want to see, the depth also varies to 30 meters in some areas and 600 meters in some areas. So this is what the range of the depth is of this shelf that we see, the first step. This is the shelf that we were talking about. Now let's go further more. Now looking at the importance of this continental shelf, what is the importance? It provides marine food, 
then they are also richest fishing grounds in the world so economically they are one of the most important areas also they are part of this economic draining of minerals petroleum oil gases so this is coming from this shelf about 20 percent of the world production of petroleum comes from the continental shelves then what we have is the polymetallic nodules now remember polymetallic nodules it means multiple metallic ores are found like manganese nodules concentric layers of iron and manganese hydroxide etc and manganese iron copper gold all these deposits are found at many places which are being extracted so this is where economic importance comes into the picture of these continental shelves all around the world now looking at the next feature as we know this is the slope area after the shelf area so this is shelf and this is slope the word itself is slope so the gradient is steeper it is about two to five degree and remember the depth also varies from 200 to 3000 now here is the range from 200 to 3000 is the range of this depth if you see of the slope and remember it is also what seaward edge or extension of this continental slope only right so this continental slope loses gradient gradually and it goes up to depth of about 3000 meters and remember it also gives rise to this continental rise at a particular point that's what it is called that after certain depth it starts to again stabilize that is where it is saying rise right so continental slope boundary indicates what end of the continents now remember this is what is the end of the continents so if you know what is a shelf area and you know what is a slope area this is the end of the continents from this the ocean surface starts right now the pure ocean surface starts from the end of the slope part that is important to remember and this also has many canyons and trenches in this particular zone at many places around the world that's why continental slopes are important then the next feature that we say is the smaller feature which we say is continental rise so if you look this is the shelf area this is the slope area and then you have another level which is called continental rise now remember these submarine canyons and sea mounts all these features are many times found on these the rise only right and then you have finally the abyssal plain so the gradient from 2 to 5 degree which is here on the slope this is to 2 to 5 degree now again goes to 0 0.5 to 1 degree so here it is again gently sloping so this was steep the slope portion was steep and this is again going gentle right so this is also like a step so stair one then you have again a slope and then stair two so it's like a stair structure that we see right and then it joins us with the main abyssal plain right then further let's understand that what is a deep sea plane or what is a abyssal plane so deep sea planes are gently sloping areas of the ocean basins as we know they are the flattest and smoothest areas which have lots of terrigenous remember this kind of deposits the word is terra so from coming from land these abiotic components right the rocks the silts the sediments all these things are deposited which are also called marine sediment right where it is deposited on these plain abyssal plain areas and remember it covers 40 percent of the ocean floor so it is maximum coverage that is part of deep sea plain and what is the depth it varies from 3000 to 6000 meters all across the oceans so it is one of the deepest areas right apart from the trenches this is what is the deepest areas in the world and remember this is like a plains that we have on the surface as well so this is an ocean plain right it has fine grained sediments like clay and silt and in details in the lectures to come we are also going to look at the ocean deposits in a separate lecture there will be discussing about different kinds of deposits that are there its classification and all so let's understand furthermore in terms of the minor features now so oceanic deeps or the trenches these are also very famous and remember mariana trench is a common name that we always remember whenever we talk about these ocean deeps or trenches and we have already learned from the geomorphology lecture where we talked about plate tectonics the subduction zone where we have this trench formation happening right so it is one of the deepest areas of the earth right and where there is a subduction zone when oceanic plate is actually subducting down there is this trench creation happening right so remember this is one of the deepest areas or depression areas of the oceans and tectonic origin is the factor here that is why plate tectonic is the main theory that describes the formation of the trenches that is to remember and there are some three to five kilometer deeper than surrounding ocean floor now this is one catch remember it is three to five kilometer deeper than the ocean floor that is important to remember and trenches also lie along the fringes of deep sea plain now this is 
along the fringes fringe areas not the core areas remember this is the fringe areas that we need to remember where you have these trenches formation and it runs parallel to the bordering fold and mountains or the island chains in many parts of the oceans as well and the famous mariana trench remember it is how many kilometers 11 kilometers about 11.23 kilometers deep in the pacific ocean that is to remember and remember this trench areas or ocean deep areas because they are active zones right active plate margins that's why you have active volcanoes and strong earthquakes part of these trenches specifically right so deep focus earthquakes occur in places like japan near this trenches right so this is important to remember now if you look into the world distribution of these trenches about 57 deeps have been discovered out of which 32 are only in pacific that is most of them are in pacific then we have 19 of them in the atlantic ocean and then we have six in the indian ocean so this is about the distribution on a larger scale that we see the next feature that we have is the mid oceanic ridges or submarine ridges so remember the north atlantic ridge or the south atlantic ridge or simply also called mid oceanic ridges so these are one of the important features of the oceans as well now mountain ranges which are the ridges are found where mostly at divergent plate boundaries where one plate boundary moves in the other direction the other moves in the different direction and from within the mantle this material comes and again deposits as a mountain that is inside the sea right so these mountain ranges can have peaks as high as 2500 meters remember and the total length that we see is 75000 kilometers and remember because of this it is one of the largest mountain systems on earth if we observe right if we consider land as well as ocean together it is one of the largest mountain systems this oceanic ridges right so remember they also have a plate tectonics based origin that's why we said tectonic origin is important and the best example that we always give is mid atlantic ridge which we are going to discuss in the lectures to come when we discuss about the ocean bottom relief of atlantic ocean specifically then we are going to talk about this particular feature which also divides iceland into two parts right so this is what is called mid oceanic ridges or also called submarine ridges then we also have what is called something that is abyssal hills now on the flat ocean there are certain hills that are there so they have different nature they have different shape so they are named accordingly one is called sea mount now remember this is like a conical shape but which is submerged underwater this is what is called a sea mount right they do not reach the surface of the ocean that is important then there are certain volcanic islands which also reach the surface right so this is little which is above the water and most of its part is inside the water so this is called volcanic island the numerous volcanic islands in hawaii islands if you see they are hot hotspot area in pacific ocean then there are something called geots and remember how they are formed when these volcanic islands this conical shape remember when this is eroded off then what happens this flat surface is left and gradually due to subsidence when these go down and many times they are surrounded by what the coral colonies the coral reefs and due to this they also subside down so these subsided hills which are flat mounted hills these are called geots in specific lectures further which are coming we'll be talking more on this formation of geots the theories that are associated right so sea mounts and geots are very common where in pacific ocean and remember about 10000 of them have already been discovered which are part of the abyssal hills so remember in abyssal hills what are there sea mounts volcanic island and geots these are the three major features that we need to remember then like the canyons on earth we have grand canyon of colorado river similarly the ocean surface also as we know have these canyons so these canyons are what formed by the river force and the material that cuts across right so this is where many canyons in the world are there and one of the huge or biggest canyons or well known is hudson canyon so remember hudson river goes inside the ocean and makes this bifurcation and creates this huge valley that we say as canyon so broadly there are three types of submarine canyons remember one is the small gorges so small it means it is not in width that much right and then second one what we say is that next one which is in terms of dendritic appearances one of the most famous dendritic pattern that we observe here is in hudson canyon and then largest canyons occur in bering sea of alaska if you see where you have this pribilof and zemchung canyons so the name of smaller canyons is oceanographer canyon near new england the middle ones are near this mississippi indus and zaire river right the hudson canyon and the largest ones are 
near the Alaska. That is Bering Sea, where you have Bering, Pribilof and Zemchung Canyons. So these are the names to remember in terms of summary canyons. Then we have another feature, which is a minor feature called Atoll. These are lower islands found in the tropical oceans consisting of coral reefs. Now remember, these are the islands which are surrounded by coral reefs on the top. Right. So in middle, they have this depression, which is a sea lagoon that you can see. Right. They're also used for tourism purposes. Many of them are found in Indian Ocean, in Maldives. And remember, this is a brackish water or a high saline water, which is there. And it is many times used for recreational purposes as well. Then next important minor features in the ocean are banks, shoal and reef. Now, remember, these are those places which are marine features related to erosional and depositional as well as biological activity. And remember, slow earth movement, that is diastrophic movement are responsible for the formation. So what is a bank? Now, these bank are marine features that are resultant of erosional as well as depositional activity. So remember this bank, this is where erosion as well as deposition happens. So, the bank is flat top elevation located in the continental margin. So, Dogger Bank in North Sea and Grand Bank in Northwestern Atlantic, Newfoundland areas are the best examples that we see in the world. And banks are sites of some of the most productive fishing zones of the world, right? So, this is important to remember. Now, what is shoal and what is reef? Let's understand. So, a shoal is basically a detached elevation with shallow depth. Now, this is the mainland and this is the detached area in between you have this shallow region of water, right? So, this is another elevated area part of the same mainland, but in between it is shallow zone, right? And it is also very dangerous for navigation because the depth of water here is not too much. So, if a ship crosses this, it can get stuck in this, right? So, that's also dangerous for navigation. And what is a reef? It is basically a organic deposit made by living or dead organisms as we know coral reef, right? So coral reefs are characteristic feature of the Pacific Ocean where they are associated with what? Sea mounds or geots. Remember, this was a geot or a sea mound, a flat top hill, right? And above this coral colonies are made. So what happens? They create barriers between the mainland and the ocean. Right. So this is called a barrier reef and largest barrier reef as we know is found on Queensland coast of Australia. Right. So this is also important. And remember, because of the again shallow water region, it is not good for navigation. That's why we say it is dangerous for navigation as well. So this is the bank, shoal and reef as a minor ocean features. So now when we have discussed about the various aspects of the introduction to oceanography in the sessions to come, we'll be talking about Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, its bottom topography and several other topics. So stay tuned, stay safe, keep watching.